he escaped it. <laughs> but they're still here. Thank the Lord. And I'm not going to lie, it was kind of rough for a few days. But the Lord healed us, and we're just so thankful, so thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning and to worship and give him praise. I wanted to read um, Psalm 103 this morning, just a portion of it. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. I pray that blessing over all of us this morning. Let's sing this morning. Y'all are going to have to help me because I'm still a little hoarse, a little cough. But y'all just sing with me.
transmissão de alto mistério para muito real ganhar ela com isso. so loving, so faithful and true, God. And we just worship you this morning in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
been through quite a lot lately, and there's still some folks going through quite a lot. Um, our church family has been impacted by all this sickness. And thank God, I believe we are all back on the road to recovery, but there are a lot who are still deep into the middle of this thing, and we need to remember all of them. Um, a lot of people are on Facebook. Some of them are saying they're sick and whatever. I'm hearing just by word of mouth of, mouth of other people who are sick. And you know, we need to remember every one of them. I believe God hears our prayers. And I believe he answers prayers. And above all, his will be done. You know, uh, If we don't have any others sick that we need to pray for, we have lost loved ones we need to pray for. So I, I know each and every family probably is, is touched by that. And I know my family is. So let's remember all of our lost loved ones today. Uh, Brother Frank Weaver and his family. We need to remember them this morning. His mom has been battling all week for her life and Frank sent word this morning that she is out of her pain. She's at home with the Lord and so we're sorry for their loss but we're glad for her gain. And so we need to remember that family, you know, even when we know where they're going, it's hard to let go of our loved ones. So let's remember that family. Uh, Sarah and Jared Long and their family have been sick. So let's remember all of them. Uh, let's remember Miss Kathy family. Uh, she's had a couple of procedures in this past week. And I understand she's doing well, but those will take their toll on you too. So let's remember her that she'll get her strength back. And her son-in-law, David Carter, is traveling today. So let's remember him. Is, are there any other prayer requests y'all would like to get in before we pray? Yes, the Gibson family and their loss of, of them. Yes, absolutely. Okay. If there wouldn't be any more, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this week, God. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have brought all of us through, Lord, that you've been there beside us, Lord, that you have helped us, that you have healed us and strengthened us, Lord. We ask you, God, to remember each and every family that we've called out to you, Lord, and God, all those that we don't even know the names of to call out to you, God. We just pray that you would be with these that are sick, and these that are lost, God, that don't know Jesus as their Savior, we pray, Father, that you would continue, Lord, to, to speak to those hearts, God. And we pray that you would continue your healing upon all these people, Lord. And we pray, God, that, Lord, as our country sends military to other countries to help and things that are going on, we pray you would just remember our military, God. And, Lord, remember our first responders, God. We just ask you, Lord, to help each and every one, God, that's trying to help someone else, God. Lord, we ask you in the path of this storm and the other storm that's behind it, God, that your hand would protect and shield, God, that there would not be any lives lost. And, God, if it be your will, Father, that you would protect each and every one of us and our homes and all that you have blessed us with, Lord. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you we're able to be back in your house, God, to have church, God. And church, Lord, is, is a state of worship, God, and we should be in a state of worship all the time, God. We pray, Lord, that you would help us, God, to speak to you, Lord, all during our day, God, as well as times like this when we come to you in prayer. And, God, we just ask you to be with our pastor, God, to strengthen him, strengthen his voice, and help him, God, as he brings the message today, God. And we're thankful, God, that you have already touched our pastor's family, God. And, Lord, we pray your will in all, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, Vision Church. Thank you so much, Miss Trudy. God bless you. It is good to be back with you guys and seeing you in person. It's good to have the uh, ability to use Facebook like we can and YouTube like we can. But it doesn't replace actually being here and, uh, and looking at God's people face to face. Amen. I asked Miss Trudy to help me so I can conserve some of my wind. I don't have very much strength in my wind. So uh, I apologize for that in advance. I hope y'all can look past it. I don't know how long I'll be able to, to speak. I haven't been speaking at all uh, this past week doing any of our Bible studies or anything like that and uh, hoping that I will be able to deliver the word today. So Lord helping us and Lord willing, we will make it. Amen. Amen. But it is good to see all of y'all and I do appreciate the prayers very much from each and every one of you. Uh, they have been felt and needed. And I do thank you so much for it. I love you guys. Amen. I had planned on preaching from John chapter 10 today in our series, The I Am's. And we were looking at uh, the third one today. That was my plan. That's what I've been preparing for all week. And uh, as I was continuing to prepare yesterday, um, I realized how much we need the context of chapter 9. To really be able to get the impact of chapter 10. Uh, I could tell you the context of chapter 9, but I don't really think it would benefit us as much as going through chapter 9 to really see what sets up chapter 10. Well, Christ tells us, first of all, that He is the door of the sheepfold, and secondly, that He is a good shepherd. And it's all connected to chapter 9. Chapter 8 chapter 9 and chapter 10, although we see them as being separated between chapter headings, they're all taking place on the same day. It's the same people. It's the same place. And we're just moving from like one scene to the next, kind of like in our daily life. And so it's, it's easy to look at those chapters and say, well, this must have took place a month ago or a year ago or or you know, in a different place, maybe in Galilee, or maybe in Jerusalem, or maybe in Judea, maybe in Samaria. These things in chapter 8, 9, and 10 are like one day, and then the next day, and then just a few minutes later, and things are progressing there. So it's important to see that in the connection of these things. So if you will, have your Bible open to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. And if you remember from last Sunday, in John chapter 8, we were looking at what Jesus revealed about Himself and the fact that He said that He is the light of the world. And He said that coming off this encounter that He had with this woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. And Jesus got rid of all of the throne stores. They moved right on out of the way. And then Jesus told this lady, showing compassion upon her, go and sin no more. And then as he was speaking these things, he revealed this, I am the light of the world. And in doing that, it enraged the religious people. And John chapter 8 is that famous chapter where there is a tremendous, tremendous exchange between the religious leaders and Jesus. It gets very heated, very elevated in what they say, even so much as they would say about Jesus that he has a demon. But Jesus would also remind them about their claim to their parentage of Abraham. Because what brought that on was that they claimed that Jesus was born in fornication, probably referring to the fact of Mary being with child before her and Joseph had legally been married. And so probably that stigma had been around for the entirety of Jesus' life and Mary's marriage uh, and subsequent marriage, I should say, to uh, Joseph there after the birth of Christ. But Jesus reminds him about their parentage. He says, you are of your father, the devil. Amen. And so you can imagine this getting more and more and more hated. And whenever Jesus reminds them, he says, he says, before Abraham was, 
I am. One of those famous I am statements about Christ. And they said, you're not yet 50 years old. When did Abraham see you? When did you see Abraham? Abraham had lived 1,400 years earlier. And so being upon all these things, building up, they finally, when Jesus said those words that before Abraham was, I am, they recognized he was claiming to be deity. He was claiming to be the voice of the burning bush. And so throughout our series so far, we've talked about that very famous statement, Jesus said, I am, going back to the time where Moses stood before that burning bush. They realized what Jesus was saying because they picked up stones and they were ready to stone Jesus. Why would they pick up stones? Because, you see, the penalty of blasphemy to them and their ears, they understood he was claiming to be God. And to them, in their unbelief and their doubt and their tremendous hypocrisy, they were thinking that this is a lie. And so they were going to put an end to him right there and then. So that closes chapter 8, and that picks us up right in chapter 9 as he's coming through the crowd. And if you look at verse 59 of chapter 8, brings us into the tie-in. Then he took, they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Verse 1, chapter 9. Now as Jesus passed by, He saw a man who was blind from birth. I love this about Jesus. The Feast of Tabernacles has come to a close. The putting up all of the things for that eight day long feast. Jesus had just proclaimed, building upon that fact of those torches being rolled up, that He was the light of the world. The Pharisees wanting to take up stones and kill Him. And He's going through them. It almost seemed kind of hurriedly to keep them from trying to kill Him. And what does Jesus see? He sees a man in need. We might would think, man, that's a good way to get out. Get on out of there, Jesus, and go and hide yourself. But on his way out from them, about to stone him, he sees a man, a man in need. I love that about Jesus. That even in the midst of a really tense situation, a really hard situation, a fleeing for one's life as it would seem, that he takes the time to notice a person in need. And so this entirety in chapter 9 is about this man who was born blind. And born blind from birth, and his disciples, verse 2, ask him, ask Jesus, saying, Rabbi, who sent this man or his parents that he was born blind? And so the disciples now, seeing that Jesus has caught the eye of this man, and this man has caught the eye of Jesus, they realize that he is a blind man, has been born blind. No doubt they had seen him there in the temple. Why would he be there at the temple? Because when people would come there to the place of the temple to worship God, no doubt they would be in an attitude of giving alms, giving out things for people that were like this man who had been resorted to the place of a beggar, having to beg alms in his condition. You see, a person born blind would not have been allowed into the synagogue, into the place of the temple to worship. He has a mother and father that we're going to see, but they had also, it would seem like, disowned him because they're not taking care of him. He is actually having to beg. And so they see this man in need, born blind, never having seen. And the disciples immediately put the question to Jesus, why was he born blind? And the sin that obviously has resulted in him being born blind, who committed it? Was it him or was it his parents that he was born blind? Now, Understand, in the Jewish mind in this particular time, they would see this as a result of, of sin. That the infirmity because of the eyes, being born blind, something happened either with his parents, they sinned, or this man, he has sinned, that has resulted in him being born blind. So that's the question. It's not, are you going to do anything, Jesus? It's not going to, are you going to heal him? It's, who sinned, this man, or his parents. Now you might say, well, that's kind of a crazy idea to have. 
But now you think about this. In our world, we know today that if we're talking about the sins of the parents, you know, there are, are venereal diseases, there are sexually transmitted diseases that can be passed on to a, a child during the birthing process and can cause that child to be blind. And today, by the advances of medicine, you know, they, they take a solution and they put in those babies' eyes to prevent that, to prevent them from going blind. And so we could see, even in our day, how someone could say that about a baby, an individual, that because of a sin in the parent's life, because of the STD, that has been transferred over to the child. The Jewish people also had a belief that a child could actually sin in the womb. And they would base that upon the story of Esau and Jacob as they were in the womb, wrestling there in that mother's womb. And they would pull upon that and say, it is possible for a child before it is born in the womb to commit sin and therefore be the reason that that baby is born blind. So all of these things are going on in their mind. They're trying to get some kind of theological answer from the Lord. But you know, the Lord is really not interested in their theological arguments at this point. Why? Because he sees a man in need. He wants to do something very practical. He wants to set this man free. And so he answers them, and listen to what he says. Neither this man nor his parents sin. So it's not what you're thinking. It's not something that he did in the womb. It's not something that his parents did that has caused this man to be born blind. It's neither one of those things. And notice this next word, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of Him who sent me. While it is day, the night is coming when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, Jesus says this, I am the light of the world. Now when we look at this and we think, wow, that sounds kind of harsh. Sometimes we read that, it says, are you meaning to tell me that, that what Jesus is saying to those disciples is that this man has endured a, a lifetime of blindness? just so that he could encounter Jesus late in his ministry. You see, there's only about a month away from this time in the cross in Jesus' ministry. Are you saying that, that that's just some type of a, uh, an experiment? Some type of a, a thing done just so Jesus can show up here at the end of his ministry and, and heal this man? That kind of sounds kind of cruel. But if you will look with me at this statement again, and let's... Look at it in a way of, of emphasis. Hopefully, it'll make a little more sense to us in, in this way. Look at it one more time with me. Neither this man nor his parents sin. That's, that's the end of that question. Are you with me? Okay? That's settled. It's not a sin of the parents. It's not a sin of the man. So there's the answer to your question. Very, very tersely, very succinctly. Neither one. It's not sin. But then picking up on a brand new idea, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. See, the Lord is wanting to do a work in this man. Why? Because time is short. Time is short. He says that. He says, I must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. You see, for Jesus, he realizes that in less than 60, 90 days, he's going to be back in heaven. In 30 days, he's going to the cross. Three days in the tomb. Resurrected on Sunday. 40 days of earthly ministry, and then he goes back to heaven. But while he's here on the earth, while there's still daytime, night is coming. The cross is awaiting. But there is still daylight. And while there's daylight, he says, I must do the works of the one who sent me. Underline that, put a circle around that, that he was sent by the Father to do the works of God. Amen. And this man caught Jesus' eye. And Jesus realized there's opportunity for me right now. Why? Because it's day. And people work during the day while it's light. People don't work at night, especially in this world, in this culture here. Of course, we worked almost 24-7 in many places here, but not in this time. 
And when night's coming, no one can work. So Jesus says, I have opportunity. I have a, a, a chance to impact this man's life. And so hopefully if you can see it in that way, it's not that the, the man was blind for the entirety of his life just so he could perhaps come into contact with one who can heal him at the very end of Jesus' ministry. But that Jesus, on his way out, hurriedly perhaps, trying to, to get away from those trying to kill him, sees an opportunity in his day because he, Jesus, said, I am the light of the world. While I'm here, I'm light. And the Father has sent me. And here's an opportunity for me to do something. And the day is drawing to a close. The night is coming. But the Father has sent me. And I'm about to do something for this man. Amen. I don't know how many of you think about that during, during your, your life or during your day. About how much possibility of opportunity we have in our life. To do the works of the Lord that has sent us. Because for each one of us, you know, there's night coming. There's each one of us when the day is going to come to a close and, and night will be upon us and we won't be able to do any more work in this life and in this body and in this particular world. Our, our time will become to a close. But while we still have day, while there's still light, and God gives us opportunity to do something for Him and for the glory of God, are we not to be about the Father's business and whatever that may be? Amen? Oh, I think so whether it's going out and doing a good deed for somebody, being a blessing to someone. Jesus spoke about giving a cup of cold water in his name. Jesus also said when they look at the sheep and the goat judgments, whenever they're, they're called to account there at the end of the tribulation, those that were, were, would not visit a person in a prison or would not clothe one who was naked or would not give something to eat to one who was starving. They said, well, when did we not do that to you, Lord? He said, when you didn't do it one to the least of my brethren, you did it not unto me. Amen. So the little things in life, while it's still day, ought we not to be about doing those things while it's still day? Jesus realized that and took this opportunity and he said, hey, it's still day. The Father has sent me. Here's someone I can impact and change this gentleman's life. I've got to be about that. Do you remember when Jesus at 12 years old, what did he say? They were looking for him. They had missed him. I don't know how they would miss Jesus, but somehow or another they missed Jesus. They made a trip back over a period of long days, and they find Jesus, and they kind of chided him that. He said, didn't you know I should be about my father's business? He understood that at just 12 years old. How many of us understand that about our life, that God has given us a ministry, a personal ministry, personal ministry of prayer, personal ministry of intercession, personal ministry of help, personal ministry of perhaps teaching, of, of being a, a, a leader in some capacity, being a person of influence in someone's life. Amen. Oh, Jesus realized that the essence of the day, and he wanted to capture it. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, verse 6, he spat on the ground, and he made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man, with the clay. Now, by the way, this is the only uh, congenital miracle that we have of Jesus. Jesus healed many people that were blind. And he did it in different ways. But this man has never seen. His eyes have never worked. And so we look at what this miracle is. And by the way, this is the only time in which he does this particular miracle. There was blind Bartimaeus. If you remember blind Bartimaeus, and he was there calling out to the son of David that he wanted to receive his sight. And Jesus says, your faith has allowed you to see. He just simply spoke the word and he believed and he was able to see. There was the other person that, that Jesus actually had to touch his eyes, not just once, but twice, in order that he could see clearly in that way. But here's another issue, another person there, a man who has never seen. And so he does something very strange and he does it on the Sabbath day. Now, Again, we always know Jesus never backs down from those Pharisees and those religious people and their religious ideas and their, their traditions that they had exalted above the very law of God and the Word of God. And so it's almost like he's using this opportunity and, and the way he does it to kind of, kind of push him a little bit more. You see, because in the Jewish legal system, the Pharisees had 
come up with. They believe, this is not from the Word, this is from their traditions, they had made a ruling that to make clay on the Sabbath day violated the law of God. Why would that be, Rick? Well, we always go back to the commandment to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. They had expanded upon that. We've spoken about that over many years, all the different types of things that they would talk about, picking up sticks or you know, tying a rope. I think we talked about uh, tying a knot in a rope a few weeks back and things like that. You see, to make clay, you could actually build a house with clay because you could make bricks. And so that would constitute working. So for a, a person to spit on the ground and that spit would combine with the dirt and make clay was a violation of the Sabbath. Are you with me? Men's traditions. And so here he is in this work about to do something for this gentleman, make him some brand new eyes, I believe, is the creator of the universe. You know, John in his gospel, the first chapter, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were, what? Made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And so how did, in the very beginning, in the opening chapters of Genesis, how did God form man? He, he spoke everything else into existence, but when it comes down to the, the, the epitome of His creation, the Lord stooped, and out of what? The clay. He formed this lifeless being that would be called Adam. And into that lifeless being, he breathed into him what? The breath of life. And Adam became a living soul. The combination of the, of the Ruach, the Spirit of God, with that lifeless clay made man a living being. And so I, I look at this and we can really pull different, three different things out of this miracle, what Jesus is doing here. Number one, I think it's perhaps showing us that he is the creator. Amen. That the same way in which he formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, he's going to make for this blind man who has never seen, his eyes have never worked, a pair of brand new eyes. How? Exactly like he made them when Adam was being formed. Out of the dust of the ground, out of the clay. And so he, he spits on the ground and takes that clay coming up with the dust and the spittle and puts it in his eyes perhaps making him some more eyes. The second thing is, in that culture, the Jewish people believed that spittle had healing properties. They believed that it had some type of a medicinal quality to it. And so for that sense, perhaps Jesus is just using the, the prevailing idea of medicine. That medicine, people believe spit has uh, medicinal properties to it, healing properties to it. Well, hey, I'll, I'll pull upon that and I'll I'll make some clay with my spit. And so we'll, we'll look at that as well. In our day, of course, we know that medicine is very important. Doctors are important. Medicine is important. The treatments are important. And there are many ways, you know, that the Lord can heal. The Lord can heal through the opportunity of prayer. He can heal by the way of uh, the anointing oil. We pray for a person. The Bible speaks about that. To have the, the elders of the church anoint that person with oil and pray over them the prayer of faith. The Lord can also bring a gift of healing through an individual. That that person there becomes a, a point of contact between the Lord and that sick individual. And the Lord can bring a gift of healing through that person. And the Lord can also just heal completely supernaturally just by speaking the word. But the important thing for you and me to see is that prayer in and of itself is not the in and of itself the, the way in which we're healed. Medicine in and of itself is not the way in which we're healed, although God can use it. Doctors in and of itself are not the, the way in which we're healed, even though God can use those things. The, the way in which we are healed is from the Lord. Amen. You know, the Lord has given us a, a, a spectacular body that is able to, to, you know, we call it heal ourselves. Remember not too long ago, you know, I, I, I pinched the end off of my, my, uh, my little finger here, and there was nothing there all the way down to the, to the bone and then it's got skin on it today just wrapped it up and I remember the doctor telling me you know the, the body God has built amazing healing properties into the body and you look at that and you say wow that's amazing and you experience that too you get a cut and before long boy, it stops bleeding and then a scab forms and before you know it 
you know, it's all better. But without the Lord, those things will never happen. Without the Lord. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, come down from above to me and you. So God can heal through prayer. Yes, it's not the prayer itself that heals. It's God that's working through the prayer. It's not the anointing oil that heals. It's God working through the anointing oil. It's not the, the gift of healing that heals. It's God working through the gift of healing. Amen. Amen? The important thing that we need to realize is that God is the one who brings the healing. Amen. And so here he is either using this as a creative display of his power to create something that's never, ever worked. Perhaps he's using it building upon the prevalence of the idea of medicine. But the other thing that I would encourage you to to think about is that this is an irritation. An irritation that causes this guy to be motivated. Anybody ever had dirt in your eye? Not very pleasant. What's the first thing that you want to do if you get dirt in your eye? You want to go and wash, don't you? You want to get it out. Go to the mirror, see if you can, you know, get some wash or something, maybe some water, maybe some eye wash, or you got contact, you know, pull that contact out and rinse it. You want to get it out because it's very painful. So perhaps, perhaps what's going on here is that not just that he's showing his creative power as the creator of mankind, not just that he's using the idea of medicine, but he's providing some irritation for this guy so that he will do what the Lord wants him to do. Amen? Amen. Hey, he put some spit in my eye, you know. Well, I don't know why you've done that, but it burns. And I'm going to do what you say to do. What does he tell him to do? He said to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Amen. By the way, Siloam, if you look at it, what does it say? Which is translated sent. Sent. Now if you back up just a, a couple of verses to verse 4, Jesus says, I must work the works of the one who sent me. Amen. He sent Jesus into this world to do the works of God. And now Jesus puts mud in this guy's eyes and I don't know if he's hollering or screaming or, or mad or what. Jesus said, I want you to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Not, not a whole lot of motivation needed at that point, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just point me in the right direction. Now keep in mind, he can't see Jesus. He's blind. But he can hear him. And this stranger just put mud in his eyes, and he says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And so there he is, you know, making his way to this place to wash. Why? Because Jesus provided an irritation for him, to motivate him Amen. to do what he wanted him to do. Yes, Can I suggest to you that that happens even in our day? Yes. I've been so irritated the last couple of weeks. And you know what the irritation does? I don't know, you guys probably never get irritated, so this is probably something foreign to you guys, but you know, I get irritated sometimes. And you know, irritated at the things that you see, irritated at the things that you read, irritated at the things that's going on in your life, irritated perhaps with, with people. And you know what it drives you to do or what it should drive you to do? You know what perhaps the Lord is trying to do through that irritation? It's to try to drive you back to the water, not of Siloam, but the water of the Word. Amen. And in the water of the Word, you get into the Word, you know, you're irritated, you're aggravated, and it has driven you there. The Lord has been using that irritation to do exactly that. Like he did in this guy's eyes to drive him to the pool of Siloam, which he would no doubt be in a hurry to do to get this irritation out. I think perhaps the Lord a lot of times for me and you uses irritations in our life to drive us to the water of the Word. So we'll get into the Word. And you know what we find when we get into the Word, having been irritated? We find refreshment and we find cleansing. And, you know, we look back and we say, oh, Lord, now I see. Why? Lord, you were bringing that irritation. You allowed that irritation in my life. Why? To get me back in the Word. To get me back in this place. To send me here. Lord, you sent this irritation into my life to send me to the refreshing qualities of your Word so that I would find answers. And, Lord, it's, it's not this thing that, that I'm so dependent upon. It's not this thing that I'm so relying upon. It's not this thing that has the answers. It's, it's your Word, Lord. Lord, thank you for that irritation that has driven me there to see the real meaning of life and the real answers. Oh, praise the Lord. And so he went and he washed and he came back, what? He came back seeing. 
Now therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat and begged? So the neighbors, we're going to see as this progresses, people get interested in this, this man that was born blind. Now he can see. The first people that come on the scene are the neighbors. And they realize this person. And they say, hey, this, isn't this a guy? Isn't this the one that was born blind? How is it that now he's, he's able to see? And in verse 9, some said, this is he. Others said, he is, he's like him. And he said, this man that was born blind but now is able to see, I am he. So the, immediately after the Lord has done a work in this man's life that he could not do for himself, what happens? There starts to be a commotion and a what? A division. People that have seen him all his life. Now they can't decide if it's him or this looks like him. It can't be him. Yet yeah, it is him. I am him. It's me. And so he answered and said, excuse me, verse 10. Therefore he said, they said to him, how were your eyes open? Now underline, if you will, that word how. And as we go on through this chapter, you're going to see that it is repeated, this question and that word how, four times. Four times they ask about this. How did this happen? How are you now able to see? How did this man open your eyes? So I suggest to you that that is the wrong question. The real question is not how, H-O-W, but the same letters rearranged, who? Who? It's not how, but it's who. And so the question of the people, you know, how did you able to see? How did this take place? Finally, we're going to see the emphasis and the focus come upon not who, excuse me, not how, but who. And I want you to see, this man now who's been given his physical sight now begins to get spiritual insight. And I want you to see how quickly it takes place. Keep in mind, this man was not allowed to be in the temple because of his infirmity. This man had not received rabbinical training. This man could not see these things. He couldn't read because he could not see. But yet I want you to see how profound, now that this work has been done in this man's life, how quickly he now begins to grow spiritually. Look at the first progression here. How are your eyes open? And he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. So what's the first movement that we see in this man? The first thing he says about how he was healed, a man. Just a man named Jesus. That's where it starts. But that, thank God, is not where it ends, JB. It starts, though, with the understanding of a man. A man named Jesus. How? Where is he? I have no idea. And so it progresses on from there. They brought him who had formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, and then the Pharisees also asked him again, how, there it is, how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay in my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Then the Pharisees, uh, excuse me, therefore some of the Pharisees, verse 16, said, this man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others says, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? Speaking about Jesus. And there was a what? A division among them. Jesus will always bring division. Look for it. Understand it. God, just by using the name God, that doesn't bring division. People all around this world will speak of God. You know, talk about God. But God is, is not the same as Jesus in the sense of being descriptive. Jesus, of course, He is God, the very Son of God. He's part of the, the Trinity. He is the Son of God. But when you say God, people will use that word and throw that term out. And it's not divisive because every major religion has at its center God. But it's different, it could be. Allah, it could be Elohim, it could be 
mother of God. It could be all kinds of things. And so God itself is not divisive. But if you bring Jesus into the picture, it's going to be divisive. Jesus was always going to bring divisiveness, always going to bring division. Why? Because it is so exclusive. Whenever Jesus speaks about himself, we're going to see in the next chapter, when he speaks about himself being the door, and later on as we, Lord willing, get into this uh, I Am series a little bit further, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. People will look at you and they say, how in the world can you believe in such an exclusivity of just only one way, and that one way being Jesus? And Jesus, in your life and in my life, and I'm sure that you realize that when you become a believer, when you started putting your faith in, in Him, in Christ, in Jesus, and believing in that exclusivity, you realize it causes what? Division. That's exactly what happens in this man's life here. The Pharisees begin to argue. They say, hey, this man broke the Sabbath. He can't be doing that. And so the division in the group, what do they say? Hey, nobody who doesn't come from God can do a miracle like this. And so the Pharisees, verse 17, they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. Notice he says this, he is a prophet. What did he say at the very beginning to the people? The neighbors there? He's a man. And so they take him to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees begin to question this man. You know, they don't want him to be able to see. They're kind of angry that he's able to see, and even more angry than the one who was able to help him get him to a point where he could see. And so they ask him, who, what do you say about this man? Not he, now he's not just a... A man, now he's moved to the office of what? Of a prophet. Amen. There was a belief in the, the fact of the prevailing Jews. There was actually a, one of their sayings, if you would, that, that when a pr true prophet of God could come, that he possibly might would suspend the laws of the Sabbath concerning himself. One of their kind of sayings, one of their kind of beliefs there. Not again from the scripture, but from, from their understanding, what they're teaching there. And so this man, he is, he is really growing quickly. He is graduating on up this ladder, if you will, of his understanding about who this person is. First, he's a man. Now he's a prophet. But actually, Jesus is much more than a prophet. Amen? Amen. Verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been born blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. Why is it so difficult for them to see that this man is able to see and he was born blind? Why is it so hard for them to acknowledge a true miracle right in front of them? But they're so closed in their spiritual sight. They have physical sight. They have the scriptures. They're experts in the law, experts in the word, have much of it memorized, teachers of the law, supposed to be the shepherds of the people of God. And yet when a true miracle of God is standing right there in front of their face, they're doing everything they can to disprove it. And so they bring his parents and they said, verse 19, they ask him, how is it, excuse me, is this your son who you say was born blind? And there it is again. How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, he will speak for himself. Wow. The parents throw the man under the bus now. Now why would they do something like that? There's a fear of being thrown out of the temple in a form called excommunication. That's what they're afraid of, being excommunicated by the Jewish leaders. And if you're excommunicated, there's three phases of it, but the most severe form of this excommunication is that you are not allowed back in the temple. You could not come back and worship the Lord there. You would not be allowed in the congregation. You would be shunned socially. People would not buy and sell from you if you had a business or a, a venture or whatever. And so you would be ostracized and isolated from the community. Can you imagine what it would be like 
not to be able to go to temple worship, not to be able to go to the sacrificial system, not to be able to, to socially interact with the community there to buy and sell. You would be totally isolated. And they had that power within them to do that, to excommunicate a person like that. And so here's these parents who had not been providing for their son. He was out there having to beg already. And when it comes a chance for them to be able to stand up now for their son, whom they had brought into this world, what do they do? He's of age. You go ask him. He's our son. Yeah, he was born blind. We don't know anything else. Go ask him. And so we come back to this section. His parents, verse 22, said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ or he was Messiah, speaking about Jesus, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So they called the man, verse 24, who was blind, and they said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Now why would he use that phrase, give God the glory? That's a way, like we would today, of being in court and asking us to put our hand on the Bible and the other one to make a, a, a statement that I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They're trying to put this man under oath, if you will. It would probably remind you of the time where Joshua confronted Achan as they had went and conquered Jericho, but were told not to touch the spoil. But that one man, Achan, did what? He took the gold and the Babylonian garment and some silver and he hid it under his tent. And then whenever they went out to fight Ai, they had a tremendous loss. You know, they went to Jericho and had a great victory, but they suffered tremendous loss. Joshua was there crying out to the Lord and the Lord says, Joshua, there, there's sin in your camp. And they drew lots and it got narrowed down and narrowed down and narrowed down and narrowed down. What had happened? Who had took it? And it came upon Achan and his family. God narrowing the, the scope down to the source of the sin. And Joshua does what? He says, give glory to God. Confess this thing. The same term there. Tell the truth, Achan, what you've done. Here they're doing the same thing to this man. They're putting him under oath by using this word. Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner in verse 25. I love this man. I love this man. Listen to what he says. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. <laughs> One thing I know. That though I was blind, now I see. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to get into your theological arguments. I'm not going to get into some type of a discussion with you guys about if he's a sinner or if he, he did it's something that violated the Sabbath. The only thing I know, the one thing that I know, he says what? I was blind and now I can see. Oh, praise the Lord. What is that, guys? That's what we call a, a testimony. A testimony. Being a witness. You see, the most powerful way of, of being